Hi, I'm Miguel Reguero. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome and thank you for joining us for episode three of a three-part CMEO cast series of best practices in the treatment of underserved patients with IBD. Today's episode is titled Unique Approaches to the Management of Underserved Patients with Inflammatory Bowel Disease. This activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, which is an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. It's supported by educational grants from Janssen Biotech and Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Again, I'm Miguel Reguero. I'm the chair of the Department of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, also the PRC and Renee A. Bora Family Endowed Chair in Gastroenterology and Hepatology and vice chair of the Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute and professor of medicine at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Today, it's my absolute pleasure to have joining me my colleague and friend, Dr. Sophie Balzora. Dr. Balzora is the Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, NYU Langone Health in New York, New York. Welcome, Sophie. It's great having you today. Thank you, Miguel. I appreciate that. So to frame today's episode, you know, Sophie, we're going to talk about healthcare disparities, underserved populations. Let's start by reviewing our learning objective, which is really to initiate multidisciplinary collaboration to also provide the best medical care we can to underserved children, adolescents, and adults with inflammatory bowel disease with guideline recommended care. So as we think of this, and, and again, I know a lot of people out there who are listening are in clinical practice. Some may be in tertiary academic centers. Many are in the community. Maybe you can start, Sophie, by telling us um, what are the numbers? How do you look at our disparities in IBD care? Just kind of what are some of the nuts and bolts as far as incidence, prevalence, and, and numbers in general? Sure. Um, I mean, I think what's important to note, first of all, is that uh, you know, with disparities in IBD care, I think a lot of people aren't really cognizant that they even exist. So I do think it's important just to kind of lay some groundwork and go over some numbers um, that may be uh, shocking to many. Um, so first, uh, as it says here, uh, there's a three times increased likelihood um, of IBD hospitalizations and mortality in black patients compared to white patients uh, and Hispanic patients. Uh, and the incidence rate of IBD hospitalizations is actually four times higher in patients with low socioeconomic status. Black patients are also less likely to receive preventive care in IBD, and that includes things like uh, DEXA scans, um, ophthalmologic exams, flu vaccination, and cervical cancer screening. And then finally, Black patients are less likely than white patients to be under the regular care of a gastroenterologist. So, I mean, when we think about all of these, uh, you know, these time points in the continuum of IBD care, we see a, a lot of ways, um, you know, we're disadvantaging uh, Black patients. Um, and also other, you know, patients of color. So I think that, you know, we're talking about even patients who are in remission and we're thinking about healthcare maintenance, which sometimes fall to the wayside. You know, the first thing I'll say is in general with all IBD patients, we see that preventive care utilization is actually less in IBD patients compared to um, the general population. But then when you break that down even further, you know, we really need to understand why certain populations um, of our IBD patients are not really utilizing care as much. Um, and I think that, you know, hopefully in the next uh, uh, several minutes, we'll get to the heart of that. Yeah, so I mean, incredibly important points. I mean, it, it's, it's unfortunately something we've talked a lot about over the years in healthcare in general and primary care. Haven't, haven't talked about it as much in IBD or in specialty care, but I think some of these points are very important that you raise. And, you know, as we go on to the, to the next topic, I guess the question is, you know, what are, what are shared experiences of minority patients with IBD? I mean, some examples, um, um, I know we see this, but again, for those uh, out there, give us some concrete thoughts or examples around this. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, we need to call a spade a spade, right? Racism is in medicine. Racism is, uh, you know, very much a part of what we do in a way that we're not cognizant of. And I think that it's important to realize that um, you know, it's not about calling one person a racist or one, you know, one institution a racist, but this is something that's entrenched in the system, right? When we talk about racism, 
in medicine, we're talking about structural racism. We're talking about institutional racism. Um, and those are things that are much more insidious. Um, and unfortunately, because they're so insidious, they're much more powerful, they're much more impactful. So I think in order to you know, change some of, those, uh, you know, some of those data that we saw in the previous slide, we need to understand that um, you know, the structural and institutional aspect of things because the absence of that perpetrator, I think makes structural and institutional racism much easier to ignore, right? So we need to understand that, that, we, that we always have to ask ourselves, how is racism operating here? Um, and so I, I think that when you talk to a lot of your patients with inflammatory bowel disease who may be marginalized, who may be underserved, they can point to a lot of specific examples that ultimately, when we think about things like social determinants of health, we're talking about those upstream and midstream determinants that result in what we're seeing when we have a patient in front of us in the office. So that's guess, where I want to start. Yeah, no, and I, I think that um, also thank you for for being so clear on that. I think that's that's something that again, um, probably until recently, is not something that has risen to the awareness. So I think discussing this, having these open discussions, and I, and I think as we move on to looking at how we mitigate this, I guess the question for you is. What, what approaches should we take, um, you know, both from individual healthcare providers and to your point about systems and institutions? Like you said, there, there's an institutional racism that we don't talk about very much, but how do you mitigate these disparities? Well, I think, you know, um, understanding that it is a system is quite important, right? Um, and I think that we need to look at um, the social determinants of health more clearly I think that it's it's sometimes hard to concentrate on either because it seems like it's insurmountable or you know what can I do as an individual? But I think that that collective work, I think things coming from the top, I think understanding that things need to be um, kind of deconstructed and built again as opposed to working within the the system that we're in. Um, so for instance, we think about implicit bias, right? We're always focusing on implicit bias training and talking about microaggressions, which of course are important things, right? That whole death by a thousand cuts. Um, you know, is, is definitely important to focus on, but that really, that really focuses on the individual and personalized racism. But um, I think that again, looking at systems, understanding how leadership operates, understanding who's at the table and who's making decisions, seeing if there are any community members that are involved in these decisions is also important, right? Um, I think people who are in the closest proximity to the disparities should really have a say in how things are, um, you know, are built up again in a way that's more equitable. Um, and then, you know, going down the list, looking at uh, the number of URIMs who are healthcare practitioners, right? The number of upper, uh, underrepresented minorities in medicine is huge because we know things like physician-patient, uh, you know, concordance plays a role in improving adherence, improving patient activation. Um, and we've seen this in other disciplines. And I think that this is very much applicable to uh, gastroenterology as well. Um, and so when we, when we see things like underfunding with NIH grants, uh, black patients, black uh, scientists compared to white scientists, we see the number of, um, you know, of URIMs in GI, for instance. You know, all of those types of things will ultimately play out in the disparate outcomes that we see. So those are things that we need to target from, I think, a workplace standpoint. Um, continuity of care and patient-provider communication, right? Shared decision making. We know in a lot of chronic diseases, particularly with inflammatory bowel disease, can be very powerful for people who want to engage in that. So I think that it's important to realize that we need to. Um, you know, practice that culturally competent care uh, in order to get to where we need to go. Um, and so, you know, when we look at all of these things, like telehealth, I think is huge, which we, which we certainly will go into, um, especially in the era of COVID um, and the disadvantages that we can see um, in certain populations and how it can be very advantageous to others. So all of these things are, you know, very much intertwined, very much uh, related, but ultimately it, it does stem from those, um, you know, those upstream social determinants of health and then the downstream outcomes that we're seeing um, at play today and, and completely amplified um, by the current uh, you know, pandemic. Yeah, you know, and I think, uh, as you said, the pandemic unfortunately has magnified some of this and the world's events in the last year, mm -hmm. um, uh, sadly, but uh, to some degree maybe has made the awareness even higher. And I, I think one of the points that you mentioned that's important is the, the change in system and institutions from the healthcare provider, underrepresented minorities. Um, I like the idea of, of the, from a science standpoint, as far as better representation, funding, uh, 
but also in, in medical communities. And I, I think to your credit, I know you've done a lot of work in this area. I think that that's an hugely important and that's, that's how change will really be made. I also um, wanna pick up on as we kind of move to telehealth in the, in the pandemic, you, you know, we've all been doing telehealth. This is probably here to stay. Yeah. Um, it's really magnified our ability to interact with patients in the pandemic, but I think going forward, um, but also I think that telehealth may also kind of uncover some areas of, of disparity, right? Uh, you know, whether it's economic, technology, uh, accessibility, but has, how has this scaled up um, approach to telehealth helped mitigate disparities or, or magnified? I mean, you know, it could be both. So kind of what are your thoughts around equity and telehealth? Yeah, so I think I think you bring up a good point in that it, it can be both, right? It's 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 hard because there are so many advantages to telehealth on its face. But then when we think about the population that we're focusing this this you know this time on, people who are very elderly, people who you know are are not proficient in English, people who um, you know are from uh, you know poor uh, income families and communities. They're not the ones who are taking advantage of telehealth, right? So we need to recognize that digital disparities do exist. And, um, you know, I think that there's some really important work being done in this area right now. And I think even just acknowledging the fact that it does exist, as you see in this data here, is very important. So when we think about telehealth, when we think about people who may not have broadband internet access, when we think about people who don't have that digital skill set, you know, we need to provide the tools for those types of patients to learn those skills. We need to be able to, um, you know, to strengthen our ability to have uh, you know translators available via phone. We have to understand that if people can't use the uh, video visits, that telephone is definitely a viable option, even though it's not the best option, and obviously much farther from from human contact um, than we'd like to be. But I think that implementing you know and being being flexible is going to be really important, and having that extra focus on those patients who will suffer most and the patients who are most vulnerable, I think is really where we need to um, to act. So there's a lot of um, conversation about, you know, centering the margins, right? So people who are marginalized, people who may be disadvantaged, that we oftentimes may not think about when we're thinking about things like telehealth, are the people who actually we need to prioritize. Because people who, you know, if you see in these in this graph, the people who are, you know, ramping up telehealth use, um, you know, they'll be okay, I think. And of course, we have to focus on all of our patients, but they'll be okay. They have the skills necessary. They have the resources at home. But it's those other people who fall to the wayside are the people that we really need to center. Right. Yeah, so, I, so again, it, in, in one hand, it might allow better access, but in the other hand, it could be even more isolating if people don't have access to technology. And, and as you said, certain uh, communities, uh, this can be a real barrier. So um, I think while this is exciting times for telehealth, it's something that we also need to build in and, and I, you mentioned earlier uh, kind of around healthcare provider relationships with patients. And I, I wanna get a little bit into the idea of adherence, which we know is such an important topic in IBD in any disease, but certainly a chronic disease like IBD. Um, you mentioned improving adherence to treatment is one of the strategies to mitigate disparities, but can you expand on this topic of adherence and, and specifically in, in our IBD minority patients? Sure. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the interesting things that we know or that have been observed, I'll say, is that uh, patient race is one of the key predictors for treatment adherence in IBD. Um, and in a review to investigate the effectiveness of interventions, you know, they look at different types of interventions, whether they're motivational interviewing, reminder devices, um, you know, whether they're, you know, those are phone reminders or text reminders or, you know, any type of digital reminder, community health worker um, driven interventions and pharmacist delivered interventions apparently had mixed, um, you know, mixed results. Uh, but ultimately, it's that human contact, right? That human contact, unfortunately, we're lacking right now, but that seems to give us uh, the most bang for our buck. So I think that when we have the opportunity to have a patient in front of us, we really need to take advantage of it. Um, and I think that understanding not only how are we delivering our education, but who is doing the delivering um, is quite important. Uh, so, you know, that kind of goes back to the physician patient concordance and trying to increase the amount of black and brown faces we're seeing, um, you know, who are, who are giving that education to our IBD patient is quite important. 
Um, and so I think that any of those tools that we can use to improve adherence, we need to we need to try them out and we need to take advantage of them. I can say from personal experience, you know, a, a good chunk of my IBD patients are actually, you know, considered minority patients. And when they do leave New York City, which I don't know why they would, um, because <laughs> it's so great. But um, when they do leave, they say, oh, is there, you know, is there somebody who, who looks like me, who I can see in whatever city they're going to? And I always, you know, direct them to, you know, certain online, um, online resources where they can try to find somebody. But unfortunately, I don't have a lot of names for them. You know, I don't have a lot of names for them. And I think that that is something that that really can impact adherence, and I'm hoping that that will change um, with programs like this and other similar ones that are really helping to raise awareness about these, you know, these salient issues. Yeah, that that's so important. Thank you for for kind of making that comment and statement, and and I think it is true that the awareness. Um, bridging some of these divides. Uh, and this is really a national concept. And, and like you said, in New York City and other big cities, there may be um, a, a diversity that is different in different cities. So the idea, the idea, yes, so some people do leave New York City once in a while, but, but the idea of somebody leaving a big city to somewhere else in the country and really working with that around uh, race and disparities. Um, and then one, one of the, the key points before we wrap it up, uh, and I think it's maybe hard to avoid this, especially with the last year's events, are um, a debated topic around reparations for black slavery. Um, obviously, we see this in the news. We see um, pretty vivid imagery and discussions and language around this. But I guess, Sophie, if you were to, to think about this, can you tell us how um, reparations and how this helps mitigate or helps us understand how to approach healthcare disparities. I, I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts on this. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I think with reparations, yes, it's a very controversial topic, but um, at the same time, I think what we need to base it on is the fundamental understanding of two things. One is that health isn't everything, right? I mean, when you think about like economics, you think about public policies and government, you think about, you know, it touches everything. And that's what we're talking about, those social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. And so when we when we first think about reparations very superficially, it's like, what does this have to do with health? You know, why where is the tie? I don't get it. But I think when you, you know, when you when you peel that layer off, you see that um, when people are not really starting from an equal playing field, it makes it that much more difficult with each generation to get closer to health equity. Right. And so I think when we think about I don't know if you're aware of that baseball example where there's three people standing and they're trying to look over a fence at a baseball game and it's trying to, you know, you're trying to explain in very simple ways, um, you know, equality versus equity. And you see that if everybody's on, you know, has the same number of boxes and, you know, they'll get to the same height and everyone can see the baseball game. But ultimately, we need to understand that things aren't even that simplistic, right? Um, some people have, you know, aren't able to even stand on a box and they're actually standing in a hole. Um, and so I think that that's what reparations really get at is the fact that, um, you know, when you're starting so much farther behind um, and that's not being acknowledged and recognized and things like, you know, interge intergenerational wealth, you know, is being sacrificed for some people who are disadvantaged compared to others. Um, that's where reparate, that's where the discussion about reparations comes in. And I don't think that people have all the answers of exactly how it's going to work, but I think even introducing the idea and seeing that it is closely tied to public health, I think is, is crucially important. So I think that, it, you know, that's why it's important to, to, to mention it, um, to incorporate it into our conversations about health and health equity, because again, health is really tied to everything. Um, and so, and I think that knowing that and, and understanding that racism is a system that operates in so many different ways, particularly structurally, as we talked about earlier in the talk, um, is where you know the the conversation of reparations is infused. Yeah, and I think even to your point, starting the discussion and having the discussion um, around these topics, and now specifically to reparation, is is a first step. And and I think um, you know I, I credit you and thank you for even engaging in this conversation with me because this is how really I think hopefully change will come and, and change will come in a positive way in our healthcare system. So let's, you know, let's close it up now and, and maybe go through some SMART goals. And, and the SMART goals just for those out there are specific, measurable, attainable, 
relevant and timely goals. So I guess, Sophie, if you were to, to think about some of the discussion we had uh, in the last few minutes, what are some of the key messages that you would hope clinicians out there listening will take away from this podcast? Sure. Um, so I'll say that uh, being cognizant of the downstream effects of structural racism is vital. Um, utilizing telehealth via video or phone calls when appropriate, um, and considering interventions to increase treatment adherence in your minority patients are all things that we should think about um, you know, with every patient that we see um, in communities that we treat. Great. Well, you know, I, again, Sophie, I want to thank you so much. Um, as all of you out there can hear, Dr. Balzor is a talented clinician, thinker, um, I think really the future of IBD and, and healthcare in a way that um, makes me proud that you came on the program and, and did you. this with me. So I, I do appreciate your time. Um, so to wrap it up, uh, to receive CME and CE credit, click on the link identified here to complete the post test and evaluation online. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody out there for joining us today for episode three of our three-part CMEO cast and the series that we produced for you. So we really appreciate you joining us. I hope you learned from this. And to view additional episodes on the management of underserved populations with IBD, please visit cmeoutfitters.com. Again, that's cmeoutfitters.com. Thanks again for your participation and for providing the best care for your patients. Have a good day, have a good night.